Hey folks, welcome to or welcome back to Iridian Games, a channel dedicated to building and painting stuff for your tabletop hobbies. Yeah. So, this channel's been up for about, what, 12 weeks? Maybe a little bit, a little bit less, but for the past five weeks we've kind of been out of commission. Uh, because I had a personal and belated Y2K crisis wherein both my phone and my computer decided to uh, buy the proverbial farm. So it's taken a while to get back up and running. However, I've made operational contingency plans that will uh, prevent that from happening in the future. So you can expect going forward, one to two videos a week. Yeah, but for now, as I promised last episode in mid-December, it's now January 20-something, I don't really know what day it is, promised foam monolithic rock formations. You know, because who doesn't love big-ass rocks? that fit any sort of terrain, you're gonna put them on. So all you're gonna need is XPS foam. That's the uh, big foam insulation sheets you get at the hardware store. Lowe's has the blue kind. Uh, Home Depot has the pink kind. You need some hot wire tools. You actually need them for this, unfortunately. You can get a cheap one for about 10 bucks. You need a hobby knife. The brand name is Exacto Knife. Hope you can see it. Or uh, box cutters hand clamps, or rubber bands, and the last thing, polyurethane glue. This is the uh, Gorilla brand. It's, you know, the only brand I can find. Polyurethane glue essentially turns into foam. So everything becomes one big foam chunk, and you're able to carve it with the hot wire tools. All right, let's get started. So I bet when you were a kid, you didn't think you'd be making rocks out of stuff that was not rocks, but life takes you to strange places. And in this place, we're going to be taking a workable sheet of XPS foam and cutting out the basic dimensions, size, and shape of how big you want the base of your rock formation to be. Once you've cut that piece out, you're going to measure it out, cut out a second piece, and in an incremental manner, make it smaller and smaller and smaller. Each layer having a sort of terrace effect where, you know, it ascends through incrementally smaller layers into a point or an apex or a peak. That was a mouthful explanation and I hope to God it made sense. So here we go, just piece after piece outlining the last and making a smaller one. Rinse and repeat until you have a monolithic rock. And you can get to a pretty small point. Small fine point with this XPS foam. It's pretty sturdy and it will keep its shape. Keep in mind that exacto or that foam eats exacto knife blades or any knife blades and really dulls them out, so you might have to switch them regularly. Once you have the desired shape and height, you're going to take a uh, hand clamp or a rubber band. Wait, not yet. No, scratch that. You're going to take some glue, of course, and start spreading the polyurethane glue on each piece. You do not need a thick layer. Things will get weird if you put a thick layer on because this stuff really expands as it dries, which is uh, where the hand clamps or uh, the rubber bands come in. So just work yourself all the way to the top. And the hand clamps, well, since the uh, glue expands, the hand clamps will keep everything in place. So all the foam won't separate as it dries. Sometimes my rock formations are too tall for each hand clamp, so I have to break them into sections and then glue them in later. Glue them together later, the two sections that dried separately. Once they're dried, I, uh, you know, take some hot wire cutters and start carving out all the little steps or terrace mark indentation thingies and create a smooth surface, working in a manner that is represented visually in this video. Since the uh, polyurethane glue turns into foam, it cuts very nicely. If you're using a different kind of glue, like hot glue, this would be a little more difficult. Way more difficult, potentially. So, 
I definitely like this. Oh yeah, and uh, it's a cool tip is to make rock formations with two different peaks. Kind of that bifurcate into a saddle. All right, part two, carving rocks. Stand by for this public service announcement. Okay, so a quick timeout for demonstration purposes. So you're gonna take your hobby knife or exacto knife to the foam and start making cuts. A lot of cuts at 60 degree angle. Same 60 degree angle, and just make a ton of them. And when you have a ton of cuts, you're gonna come in at the opposing 60 degree angle and start making kind of like diamond shapes. Once you've made a ton of cuts like that, you're gonna just throw in some randomness. And then you're gonna start building it up in other areas like here, here, until the entire surface area of the rock is covered. When that happens, you're gonna take a wire brush, come in and start making horizontal brush strokes. And that's gonna tear out all these little shapes you made and create strata lines. And it's gonna be somewhat realistic but pretty stylized. Let's check it out. Okay, so just start by doing all that. Watch your fingers cut away from yourself. And if I do anything dangerous, I'll tell you not to do it. Safety first. So I start by cutting all the lines in one direction before I start cutting them in the opposing direction. So just working my way around the whole rock formation. And once that's done, I'll come in and cut the opposing lines next. So I keep track of everything. Throw in some randomness into the multitude of little diamond carved shapes. And then take a war brush, or a smaller wire brush works too, I'd recommend steel bristles as opposed to, uh, you know, sometimes they have brass or copper or uh, plastic bristles. You've got to be the hardest bristles you can find and start brutalizing the rock. Sometimes I'll gouge out some areas with a fingernail to just add some variation and randomness as well. If everything's looking still pretty uniform, I'll definitely do that. Okay, so you might notice that after this carving technique that there's little thin lines of glue in between each piece of foam. If you find any of those, you can just scratch them out with a, well, a thumbnail in this particular example. Yep. Okay, painting rocks. This is something you may have done as a kid. All right, so we're going to firm and seal everything in with a mixture of black paint and Mod Podge. Mod Podge is better than PVA glue for this because uh, it dries faster and it has varnish in it, way better. So just slop that on there. Only do one coat of this. Um, if you find that you missed any places or you, know, you didn't get a completely opaque coat of black paint, just come in with a second layer of black paint without the Mod Podge because Mod Podge really can obscure details. So we're going to be kind of doing some base coat, undercoat things with some really diluted paint. Here I'm using raw sienna, burnt sienna, and some like green color. And I really water it down. These are all craft paints. And I essentially make a camouflage pattern with all the different types of paint across the surface of the rock formation. So it kind of gives some natural like oxide colors underneath the layer of gray, which will primarily coat the finished product. And this is all because, you know, actual rocks are very rarely just gray. And if they are, they're not as interesting as rocks that aren't. So camo that up, it looks atrocious at this point, but bear in mind that the overwhelming majority of that paint is gonna get covered up. So we're gonna start with an overbrush of a medium or a dark gray. Essentially, you take a slightly wetted brush, get most of the water off of it, dunk it in the paint, wipe a little bit of it off. It's like dry brushing, but your brush isn't dry. You're essentially just giving a regular coat of paint on all of the raised areas and skipping the recesses. Yes, overbrushing. Great for terrain. 
Don't really do it so much on miniatures, but it does have its place. Especially when you're speed painting armies with a lot of raised details, but that's beyond the scope of this video. Then, after the mid-gray layer is complete, I'm gonna take a light gray and actually dry brush this. So, removing most of the light gray paint, and then doing a top to bottom brush strokes with the dry brush, just applying it. I recommend using dollar store makeup brushes for all your dry brushing terrain work. And you're just hitting the raised details here. Bearing in mind that you don't wanna hit all of the darker gray. You wanna leave some of it exposed so it transitions up from the medium gray to the lightest points. All right, then I'm gonna do a really phoned in wash with black India ink. India ink is usually used for calligraphy. Uh, I'm using it here because it's not as strong as acrylic ink and I had some lying around. I just mix a few drops with some water and I'm using this to kind of tone down all the colors because I want my rocks to be a little more dark and menacing. And I think the uh, dry brush highlights were a little too bright. So I just spread the India ink on there and it really tones everything down. And it's less of a wash and more of a, like a dark filter. And after all those steps and all those processes, you will have something that looks like this. But of course, you can apply whatever paint scheme you want to it. You do a sandstony scheme, you know, whatever you want. I hope this has been helpful, inspiring, useful to you in some capacity. And I uh, hope to see you next time. Next week or next video. I'm not sure when it's going to come out, but definitely before next week or next week. It's going to be a tutorial on how to build a wargaming board or a terrain board with no power tools. Yes, no power tools, and you will have a awesome 4x4 or 6x4 wargaming board that's sturdy and will hold up to all the abuse that your games can throw at it. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time. Like, share, subscribe, but only if you want to. Check out Iridian Games on Facebook or Instagram for uh, further updates and quick tips. Check you later.